I'm really excited to be here for the Double or Nothing media call with all of you, and I really appreciate everybody being here. I try to answer as many questions as I can, so I'll, I'll I will try to answer in detail, but I'll also be mindful that, that you know a lot of people want to get questions in, and I really appreciate all of you. I think uh, one of the best things wrestling has going. Obviously, the best thing wrestling has going is the fans, and one of the best things wrestling has going is that so many of the great wrestling fans are members of the media. And through you and your hard work and the coverage that you've given us, it's helped us spread AEW all over the world, where we're now in 130 countries, and this pay-per-view is available all over the world, and there's tons of buzz on it. And it's largely in part thanks to all of you on this call, so thank you. Thanks, Tony. So, as, as mentioned, we're going to start with Kimmy McIntosh of Inside the Ropes. I'm going to ask John Alba from Podcast Heat to be ready to go after after Kenny. Kenny, you're up. Great. Hey, Tony. How's it going? Hey, great, Kenny. Thanks, man. Um, listen, my question was about uh, MJF, because obviously the feud with him and Wardle has been so good. And one of the interesting aspects for me has to be see him kind of bringing up, you know, what he's going to do in 2024 when his contract's up. Can you talk a little bit about what led you to allow that element to be allowed to be part of the on-screen storyline and how valuable you see MJF to AEW long-term? Well, I think wrestling thrives when real life is on screen. And the real life conflict is often just as exciting as any conflict on screen, which is one of the great things about what AEW has brought to the wrestling business. There was no real major free agent market with the top stars, the top, top stars crossing between promotions and debuting. And frankly, you know, the competition needed to be brought to the biggest stage in the 90s. We had TBS and TNT both in the wrestling game. And now with the launch of AEW, we've been able to bring that back. And I think taking what's happening in real life and potential movement and, and kind of contract negotiation it's exciting stuff and it's uh added another element to what's already a very exciting match at Dublin Open with Wardlow versus MJF who has been very vocal not only about his own contract but about his former bodyguard and how he feels about it and how he's tried to hold down his career and I think uh for Wardlow this is a huge opportunity to actually to officially become part of AEW, but also to share a uh, that he's just MJF's heavy, MJF's thug. And for MJF, it's been a great opportunity to not only air some real life grievances and air his actual uh, status, contractually or otherwise, but I think it's just been CD2 on television and people are really excited about the fight at Double or Nothing on Sunday. Thanks, man. Hello? Hi, Jim, are you there? Did I lose Jim? Yeah, I think we lost Jim. Oh, man. Well, I, I got to tell you, Jim, okay. <laughs> Jim's in Urbana, Illinois. I know the phone reception of being from Urbana, Illinois. The phone reception is always the best out there. So, uh, Kenny, thanks for the great question, and uh, you can whoever uh, whoever you guys want to give me next, I'm ready to go. Okay, All right, I, I will jump in. Um, up next is John Alba of Podcast Heat, and then Connor Casey of Comic Book will follow that. Okay, and I am trying to find. There he is. Okay, John. If you there, you go. Yeah, I'm so bummed. I was just going to thank Jim for his time. But, Tony, thank you for your time, as always. And thank you. Uh, best of luck this weekend with what should be a great pay-per-view and festivities. Uh, I want to ask you about Warner Brothers Discovery. It's It's been a big talking point in wrestling media and in the greater scheme of media as well, what Warner Brothers Discovery has been doing. And I know you've said in other interviews how you feel pretty good about the future of your re working relationship with the entity and that the L.A. show is going to be a good opportunity to get together with them. But what kind of assurances have they given you about the future of AEW programming and where would you like to see AEW featured on their platforms? Well, right now we're featured in the best ways possible, I think, with 
AEW Wednesday Night Dynamite on TBS and AEW Friday Rampage on TNT. And we've gotten great, great, great feedback that this is, I think, going to be a great relationship between AEW and Warner Brothers Discovery. And I was so honored and, and honestly, just I think we're blessed that when we're in Los Angeles, the folks from Warner Brothers Discovery are throwing us an awesome party. And it should be something really memorable. And for the wrestlers and staff of AEW, it's a big deal that when we come to Los Angeles, we make our debut at the Forum, that we've had this awesome ticket advance. We've got a massive crowd, one of the biggest crowds ever for AEW Dynamite. And it's a long time coming that we debut in Los Angeles. And it's pretty amazing that not only do we get to debut in such an amazing place, but also that we get to have uh, this event where we're being hosted by the biggest creators of content in all the world. And we've done some really good ratings for the, for their networks. And they've been so kind to host us and, you know, throw a party for us. And, and, some of the top executives in all of Warner Brothers Discovery are coming to the forum to attend AEW and, you know, hang out with us, get to know us and spend time with us, which I think is incredibly reassuring. And I, I, I think looking at entertainment and what's happening in the consolidation in the space, you know, to have the top people at one of the greatest now uh, post-merger, the largest creator of content in the world and one of the greatest entertainment properties in the world to want to host us and spend time with the wrestlers and staff of AEW and get to know us better. That's really, really cool because they're incredibly busy. And frankly, since the merger, there are other shows that haven't gotten that kind of reception and they aren't shows anymore. They're not on. And we've gotten... Uh, great feedback about how we're doing and not only are we continuing for a long time to go with TBS and TNT and Warner Brothers Discovery but they're throwing a party for us and hosting us and wanting to spend time with us so you really can't get any more positive than the great feedback we've gotten from the, from Warner Brothers Discovery and I'm so excited about the partnership and I think it's really great for AEW that they've taken this kind of interest in us and it's all because of the hard work of the wrestlers and the staff of AEW and also because of the great wrestling fans who support us on Wednesdays and Fridays and have given us this chance to really not only survive, but really thrive and grow going forward with this awesome partner, Warner Brothers Discovery. Thanks, John. <clears throat> okay, uh, coming up next is Connor Casey from Comic Book, and then I'm going to... Uh, come in with uh, with a write-in from Sam McBeef of KPHR Radio. Connor, you're up. Hey, Tony. Appreciate you taking the time today. Um, you guys have a huge main event this weekend with Hangman Page versus CM Punk. Uh, I, my dates could be wrong, but I think we just crossed over nine months since Punk's arrival on Rampage. And I'm curious, was there a temptation to push Punk into the world championship scene right away? And if so, how did you combat that? Uh, so, Con, when you asked that, it cut out. I, I lost you for about two seconds before you said championship scene, and I don't want to butcher your question. So, can you please repeat? Sure, sure. Um, was there temptation to push Punk into that world championship scene right away? And if so, how did you combat that? Uh, no, I thought that, like everybody in AEW, it would make sense for CM Punk to come in, fight top wrestlers, and if he did want to wrestle for the championship, which I think is something that clearly is very important to him. Then like everybody else, he would come in and work his way towards the top and try and earn that top spot in the rankings. And he has really done that. I mean, he's put in the work in and out of the ring, this company. He's worked really hard. He has, in my opinion, fought some of the best wrestlers in AEW and all the world to get to this position. He debuted, taken on a young wrestler, Darby Allen, and he wrestled a lot of other really great young stars along the way, including Daniel Garcia, John Silver, uh, and many other great young guys with a lot of potential, but also a lot of veterans. Some very well-known veterans and others that probably hadn't gotten 
their due at that point. Like Eddie Kingston versus CM Punk, I thought was a great match and really pop, brought spotlight on Eddie Kingston that Eddie deserves. And so we've seen Punk wrestle top young guys, top veterans, and then he got involved in the most personal rivalry we've ever had in AEW, CM Punk versus MJF. And it helped take the company to new heights in many ways. We had amazing, amazing results, not just in terms of the, the TV, but really so much in terms of pay-per-view and merchandising and live events and all the incredible new milestones we've set with CM Punk in the company. And he's a huge part of the company, but as far as the championship scene, we've got the best champion in all of wrestling, Hangman Page. He also worked his way to the top. He came into AEW and he was somebody we thought was going to be a future champion. And he, at the, from the very beginning, was a spotlighted star, but he also didn't just get handed a championship. He took years of hard work and he also worked his way to the very top position. And I think that's why this is such an exciting match because years of hard work for Hangman and years of hard work for CM Punk before he arrived in AEW. And like you said, the last nine months, nonstop, not, not giving us a Hollywood comeback to come back for one match or maybe two matches, but to come back every week and, do this for the wrestling fans and where, you know, CM Punk's going to be featured on TV every week for us. It's a big deal. And I think it makes a lot of sense now that based on how CM Punk fought through that very personal feud and beat MJF and has earned that number one spot in the rankings. And based on how hangman taken down the great champion, his former partner, Kenny Omega and so many, awesome awesome legendary wrestlers along the way i think it's very fitting like two trains colliding that on sunday it's hangman page versus cm punk for the world title thanks connor um sam mcbeef from kphr has a pretty simple question for you here tony how do you feel this double or nothing is going to compare to all the pay-per-views that you've uh, you've produced here over the last few plus years Well, we've had a lot of success on pay-per-view over the last few years, and I think the Double or Nothing will take us to hopefully what is our biggest year yet in AEW. Every year we've had growth year over year in pay-per-view. We've been able to grow our live attendance, and this is the biggest live attendance we've ever had, and it's a great barometer in pro wrestling. And the live fans in the arena – set the pace for fans all over the world, obviously with their reactions in the arena to the people they see in the ring, but also uh, how they spend their money and, and, and how they make their presence felt at the shows. And so for us to set our attendance record already with well over a million dollars, I think over $1.1 million in tickets sold to Sunday's pay-per-view show, that is an amazing milestone for us. And I also believe it's indicative of the huge interest in Double or Nothing 2022 on Memorial Day weekend this Sunday and people all over the world coming together to watch this event and and hopefully it is the beginning of what I think is going to be our biggest year yet. Thanks, Sam, and thanks, Tony. Uh, so we're going to go now to Niger Chambers from Big Gold Belt Media. And then after Niger will be Stephanie Chase from Digital Spy. Niger, you're up. Niger, you're up. All right. Tony, how's it going today? Um, Very well. How are you? How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Blessed. Thank you. Um, Quick question about the Forbidden Door pay-per-view. So that's going to be in Chicago. How does that affect All Out, which is typically ran in Chicago? Uh, Well, I Uh, I think it makes a lot of sense. We built a great tradition with All Out around Chicago, and that's not something I take lightly. As I think most wrestling fans have become very well aware. I love the Chicago market. I was born in Illinois, and it's a home to me, and I think it's also a home to AEW and great wrestling and some of the best fans in the world. And Forbidden Door will be at the United Center, and I think All Out, that doesn't mean you wouldn't see all out around Chicago this year or any year, every year going forward. I think Chicago and, and the Chicago area 
are so important to AEW. It's in many ways where this whole grassroots movement, even before I got involved, before there was an AEW, where a lot of our stars who were with Ring of Honor at the time put together a great event all in. And now here we are approaching four years later from uh, the original all in and still the former Sears center now the now arena and, and what we have been able to create out there, it continues to grow. And I, I think that's something we'll have to keep in mind that the tradition of all out around Chicago is very, very important. Thanks, Niger. Stephanie Chase from Digital Spy, you're next. And then I'm going to go with a writing question from Craig Smith from One Stop Wrestling. Stephanie? Hey, Tony, how are you? Hey, I'm very well. How are you? I'm great. I'm really excited for this weekend. Um, I wanted to ask you, we have the finals of the Own Heart Cup at Double or Nothing. So for you, how special has it been getting to put this tournament together and honoring Owen in this way and putting his name back on TV and also having Dr. Martha Hart there at Dynamite a few weeks ago? Well, it's been great. Uh, I'm really a big fan of Owen Hart. I grew up as a huge wrestling fan. And as a kid, I was fortunate to be able to see both Brett and Owen Hart wrestle live and in person. And Owen Hart in particular is somebody, I think, who has not been seen or embraced enough in pro wrestling. And a lot of that is involved in the circumstances. A lot of that is due to the circumstances in which Owen Hart was taken away from us. And I believe Owen Hart loved the wrestling business, but I know that first and foremost, he loved his family and his family, Dr. Martha Hart, Oj Hart and Athena Hart. They came and attended AEW in New York and they were there for the opening ceremonies of the Owen tournament and they had a good time. And that meant the world to me to be able to make it an event that the Hart family would be proud of because they, had, you know, in particular, Dr. Martha Hart and her kids, Oj and Athena, they had not really been around the wrestling business or embraced the wrestling business. And to see something new that had risen up that really that we all appreciate and, and love the history of wrestling. And in particular, we all have so much respect for Owen Hart and we wanted to have this great tournament to celebrate him, celebrate his memory and his legacy and have great wrestling matches, which above all else, we see Owen Hart for his family and for being a great wrestler. So to have his family here to honor him and, and again, coming back for double or nothing this Sunday where, you know, I think Martha hopefully will say some words to the fans, which I also really, I'm looking forward to. I think it, it means a lot to me. And I think there's a lot of wrestling fans. I have to believe that are excited to see Owen Hart's likeness and image being associated with wrestling matches on TV again, especially some of the great matches we've had along the way. Uh, there's been some matches that, to me, really stood out in the tournament that I really enjoyed, including uh, Jeff Hardy versus Darby Allen, I thought was outstanding. Tony Storm versus Jamie Hayter, I thought was a tremendous match. I really enjoyed last week on Rampage, Red Velvet versus Chris Statlander. I'm looking forward to Statlander's match with Ruby Soho tomorrow on Rampage. And last night, I thought the main event, Kyle O'Reilly versus Samoa Joe was tremendous and it sets up a great final in particular with Samoa Joe versus Adam Cole, a first time match, really a dream match for many fans, including me. <laughs> and uh, something I thought would be amazing for this pay-per-view and like, you know, it's interesting because it was a little bit of a different build towards double or nothing with a lot of the TV in recent weeks and even dating back to last month being originally the qualifying matches for the Owen Hart tournament. And then, the tournament matches, which have been a big part of Dynamite and Rampage. So there were parts of the card. Uh, obviously, we're still going to find out tomorrow who's going to wrestle Dr. Britt Baker in the women's final of the Owen Hart Foundation tournament. But also, uh, we just found out the other final with uh, Samoa Joe versus Adam Cole last night. It's obviously different cadence as far as the timing, but it's also very conducive with sports. I think March Madness and a lot of other high stakes tournaments, you see that uh, the bracket is fluid and it changes quickly. And in the final four, you know, you don't know who's wrestling. Excuse me. Excuse me. Wrestling on the brain. You don't know uh, who's 
playing for the national basketball championship until roughly 48 hours before the game because of the flow of the tournament. And I think sometimes when you have these big tournaments and this, we're just, this is the first Owen Hart foundation tournament, but I really like the cadence. It's different. And I think it took some getting used to, but people from what I've seen really enjoyed a lot of those matches along the way that I named and thought it was a great main event again last night to close the show out and uh, really excited for the finals of the Owen Hart tournament and excited to see who's going to be wrestling against Dr. Britt Baker. Is it going to be Chris Statlander? Is it going to be Ruby Soho? So we'll find out tomorrow on Rampage. But so I think uh, it's been it's been great so far, and I'm I'm really excited for the finals, and and hopefully it'll be an experience we can keep bringing back to Double or Nothing, and I, and I'd look forward to doing it every year with Dr. Martha Hart and her family. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, I'm gonna read a, a writing question from uh, Craig Smith from One Stop Wrestling, and after Tony responds, to that we'll have Sean Radikin from PW Torch next. Craig asked the question is very, very much uh, in the vein of what you just discussed, Tony. The, the Owen Hart Foundation tournament has been very successful. Have you ever thought about doing a one-night tournament format in the future, maybe as a pay-per-view? I have. Uh, I try to be sensitive to the wrestlers when I do things. And I think one thing, it's gr- one thing that's awesome that I've learned in the transition from being a wrestling fan to, to continuing to be a wrestling fan, but also being a wrestling promoter, and in matchmaking is I try to be sensitive to the wrestlers and their health and take care of them. And I think that the flow of the tournament, which is a little bit different than, for example, a King of the Ring tournament that Owen Hart won in 1994 and where there, you might see multiple matches in one night or even the year prior in 1993, where Brett wrestled three times very famously in three great matches, you know, I wouldn't necessarily ask that of everyone. And uh, I don't, I don't know if it makes sense for the wrestlers to give their best matches. uh, If they, if they can do, if they can, I'd like for them to give you everything a hundred percent in the semifinal, the quarterfinal. And if people are saving it all up for the finals or vice versa, if, if they use all their energy up in the semifinal, they might not have as much left for the final. I think you're more likely to get an injury with a single night tournament. I'm not sure. I mean, sometimes single night tournaments are great. Um, but in this case, I thought for the pay-per-view, it would make sense to have matches on dynamite and rampage leading up to double or nothing to build up to big finals, including this go home week where, you know, we've had the semifinal matches and, and on dynamite and rampage are learning who's going to go on to the final. Um, so that's kind of, you know, what I was thinking, uh, as I got into it. Thanks for the question, Craig. Uh, so next we're going to go to Sean Radican from PW Torch. And after that, I will follow with another writing question from Marco Mondi from ESPN. Sean? Hey, Tommy. How are you? I'm great, Sean. How are you? Good, Good to talk to you. Um, I had a question about uh, the numbers for Dynamite and the pay-per-views have been really good. But there's still more wrestling fans out there you could potentially reach. I was wondering, what innovations or ads can you make to tweak Dynamite or Rampage to possibly go at that next million fans you're trying to grab? Well, that's that's a great question. It's probably one of the most important questions we can ask ourselves is how do you grow a fan base, especially as – uh, the TV landscape changes for us. We've been able to get great audiences supporting dynamite and rampage. And I think for us, the the best thing we've been able to do. And, and like you said, the pay-per-view numbers have been great. and They've continued to grow and grow, which is the, exactly what you want to see where every pay-per-view event in AEW has had year over year growth. That's the best trend you can have. And I think to continue that kind of growth, the best thing we can do is continue developing and continue, I don't want to say nurturing because this is a hard sport and people have beaten the hell out of each other. So I don't know if nurturing is the right word, but continuing to try to develop and take care of and and treat the wrestlers well and, and have a company where young wrestlers are going to want to sign up and learn and get better and where this is going to be the home of the best young wrestlers, but also continuing to recruit in free agency. 
So I think similar to in sports where you want to have in English football, the best academy and also do great in the transfer market or in uh, the NFL where you want to do well in the draft and get great young players in, but also you need to recruit from the outside through free agency. I think it's a mix of them. And by getting the big names in that we've had just in the past year, adding some of the top names in the sport, like CM Punk and Brian Danielson, Adam Cole, Ruby Soho and Tony Storm, who've been very influential in the Owen Hart tournament, both of them. And now we've had Jeff Hardy join Matt Hardy and they're in a big match with the Young Bucks. So I think uh, continuing to develop and, and find new homegrown stars to wrestle against and with top stars coming in as free agents who've established themselves at big promotions all over the world. I think that bodes really well for us. And there's also a potential to hit new outlets. I think right now we're a really strong TV product and uh, in, I think there's revenue streams and opportunities to put new eyeballs on AEW through streaming service. And I think that's one of the really exciting things about having a, a media partner who is the biggest creator of content on the planet and Warner Brothers Discovery is our partner side by side to work on this. Thanks, Sean. Uh, I'm going to read, read, read a question here from Mark Raimondi from ESPN, and after Mark will be Brandon Thurston from Russell Economics. Uh, here's here's a, uh, the question from Mark Tony. CM Punk has been vocal about wanting to help out and lift up the younger talents in AEW. Now he's in a position to be the top guy in the company after Sunday. How can these things coexist? Well, I think CM Punk has come in so far and had a, a great series of matches with wrestlers of all different experience levels against, you know, younger wrestlers who, frankly, even for their age, have tons of experience like Daniel Garcia and Darby Allen, but also some of the great veterans along the way and people who are a mix of the two. I think MJF's another person who has got a ton of experience for his age and I believe the people who wrestled CM Punk, no matter the result, so far have come out for the better and have reached a bigger audience and have learned in the process. And CM Punk is somebody who continuously, I think, surprises me, amazes me. And he helped grow our business when he arrived here. And I think that in particular helped put a spotlight on a lot of the young wrestlers, but he's also been a really good mentor backstage in addition to just, you know, helping people's wallets potentially by, uh, you know, getting uh, everybody in a, in a better position in this company by, by helping us get more fans, sell more pay-per-views, more merchandise. He's been that guy, but he's also been somebody that will mentor wrestlers and will watch matches with them after the fact matches they've had with him or matches they've had with other people and a number of people will watch all their matches with cm punk and he's been a great mentor to a lot of the men and women in our locker room so he brings uh, a mindset of giving back in in particular to the younger wrestlers but also he's been somebody who's done a lot for a lot of the veteran wrestlers here and in doing so He's uh, wrestled a lot of matches. He's won a lot of matches. And he's helped us by not only uh, being a great mentor, but also by being involved in really compelling television that's helped AEW a lot, including his, his program with MJF that is probably one of the mo most personal rivalries ever in pro wrestling that I've seen in, in terms of uh, – how strong the build was, how much you really wanted to see their pay-per-view match and uh, the intensity between them. And I think uh, CM Punk has helped everybody in AEW so far, but how, as to how he can coexist or do that as the champion, I think as the champion now that, you know, we'll see going into this pay-per-view if, if he could even become that, or if, you know, if that will ever happen, but I think right now we have the greatest champion in pro wrestling. So uh, Hangman Page, you know, I've said it before and I can say it again. He's done so much so far and I don't think he's ready to stop anytime soon. That's why this is such an exciting match. Hangman 
has also fought all comers. We've seen Hangman win the title in what is, I believe, our our deepest, our our longest running story certainly is Kenny Omega and Hangman Page from the very beginning of AEW. Uh, in our very first month of shows, they, they teamed up and they found they had a lot of chemistry. They'd never teamed before AEW, even though they'd been in the same stable in New Japan and Ring of Honor and places around the world as part of the Bullet Club. They became a tag team in AEW. They became the best tag team in AEW. They were the champions. They dominated early 2020 into the summer. And finally, when the team blew up and the guys went their separate ways, they became the top two single stars in AEW. And then they became the next two champions. And now Hangman, uh, after you know conquering Kenny and really uh, getting that, you know, getting that 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 rivalry, that situation with Kenny behind him, he's come out and he's done time after time for this company what nobody thought was possible. Time after time, he went out and had a 60-minute draw with Brian Danielson, which is not something that anybody had gone out and done on television in modern pro wrestling history, to go out on live television and do 60 minutes. And it was an exciting, compelling fight, and it helped us draw a great audience for the rematch when we launched Dynamite on TBS, which was a really successful premiere, largely in part to the excitement around Hangman versus Daniel, excuse me, Hangman versus Brian Danielson too. And that was a match that many people did not think Hangman Page could win and he won it. And time after time since he's been in big matches, including against Adam Cole, who's now really back on top of the mountain here in AEW. I could talk at length about that, but uh, I think Adam Page versus CM Punk, is going to be a great title fight. And one of the things that makes it so exciting is the role that both guys have been on. I think those are the best kinds of title fights. These guys are both on fire. And so we'll see. I think uh, I can't speak to what kind of champion CM Punk would be because I ha- have the best champion in wrestling right now, Hangman Page, and I'm very happy with him. And uh, going forward, I think, uh, we'll see what happens at this pay-per-view, but uh, Hangman isn't ready to stop being the best champion anytime soon. Thanks for the question, Mark. Um, next up is going to be Brandon Thurston from WrestleNomics, and following Brandon will be Samantha Shipman from the Daily DDT. Brandon, you're up. Hi, Tony. Thanks again for your time today. My pleasure. I was wondering if you could give us any insight into why Ring of Honor was acquired through a separate acquisition company rather than being acquired uh, directly by All Elite Wrestling. I'm, I'm just wondering if there are maybe exclusivity agreements that AW might be a part of the Ring of Honor content would not be held to since it's a separate entity or something like that. Uh, I just jumped on it, honestly, me personally. Uh, it was a unique opportunity. I was on the phone and I heard that if I – paid a certain price I could buy ring of honor then and there and I didn't want to complicate it or make it any more difficult than it was going to be I just said I'll do it right then and there uh me personally and it's easy for me to do that I I uh didn't have to go through any uh, you know uh I guess the way the way I looked at it at the time was the price was right the opportunity was right. And I was looking out for AEW. I think I, you know, always am thinking of AEW and in doing so, I think this transaction, it makes sense for ring of honor to be uh, its own brand and stand on its own feet. I'm not saying ring of honor is a subsidiary of AEW or it's secondary in any way. And I think that's one of the things that made ring of honor supercars uh, a really compelling event is you didn't feel like it was, a developmental show or it was a secondary show you, you had great matches on the card it was a very well received card it's been one of the best reviewed shows of the year critically and commercially it was a massive success is ring of honor as big as AEW right now no is it selling as many pay-per-views no but that was incredible growth for ring of honor a company that has over 20 years of history now and has sold a ton of pay-per-views over the years and that was, of all the shows they promoted, one of the biggest Ring of Honor shows. It was the biggest show by far in years. 
when we get all the final numbers in, when it's all said and done, it's going to be probably 20 times or more the, the recent Ring of Honor pay-per-views, like, like, you know, 20 times as many people watching. So we've been able to rebuild and get Ring of Honor, I think, to a stronger place than it's been in many, many years. But uh, I just don't see it as a, a, a secondary thing or a subsidiary thing. It's a separate standalone thing. It's one of the most important wrestling companies in the world. So uh, at the time, I thought it would make sense just to jump on it. And I was thinking, you know, me personally, that's a that's a great move. But also, I think I want AEW and Ring of Honor to work together. But Ring of Honor isn't supposed to be working for AEW. They're their own two promotions, and they're going to both be very strong with great champions. And I'll operate them separately. And 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 I think one thing that's been great since the sale has been having some of the top stars in Ring of Honor wrestle in AEW, including having the Ring of Honor World Television Champion, Samoa Joe, being involved in the Owen Hart tournament and now in the finals of the tournament, taking on one of the biggest wrestlers in the world, Adam Cole. Thanks for the question, Brandon. Uh, As promised, Samantha Shipman from the Daily DDT is next, and Samantha will be followed by Mike Johnson from PW Insider. Samantha, you're up. Hello? Hey. Hi, how are you? I'm great, Samantha. How are you? Great, thank you. Thank you for taking the time today. Um, sure. I have a question that's uh, going to go a, kind of a little bit uh, off of what you know. a lot of people haven't really talked about lately. Is So there is uh, now a relationship with GDT Pro and AEW, um, and we've seen that, you know, with Takeshita coming in and having great matches, and, you know, he had a really great match with Hangman Page. Um, but DDT Pro also has women wrestlers um, that they try to use a lot as well. So will we see AEW's women and DDT Pro's women having matches, especially since Forbidden Door, obviously, is going to focus on, with New Japan, they, they don't focus on women's wrestling at all. Um, and so, and, a, and um, AEW women didn't really get involved uh, in the Forbidden Door with Impact until Deanna Parasso uh, came in a few weeks ago. So I would, wanted to know what your plans are for the women and their relationship with DDT Pro. Well, we've had great wrestlers come in from DDT. You mentioned Takeshita, but also uh, with women's wrestling, you know, uh, Yuka Sakazaki is a great wrestler from the DDT dojo. Uh, and uh, we've had a lot of great wrestlers, male and female, from all over the world come through AEW. And I would certainly be interested in, in getting – um, men, women and men through the Forbidden Door, including more people from DDT. Uh, they're they're a great company, um, and we've had some good exchanges with them. and And a lot of the great companies in Japan that we've worked with, and and no company do we work closer with, of course, than New Japan Pro Wrestling. But uh, always looking for great talents to bring in from AEW, and and yeah, we have had some good wrestlers come in from DDT. Thanks, Samantha. Uh, Mike Johnson from PW Insider is next, and I will follow Mike with a write-in from TK Trinidad of Women's Wrestling Talk. Mike, you're up. Hey, Tony. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm hanging in there. Uh, I wanted to ask you, and I guess we keep coming back to this, the Adam Page CM Punk match on Sunday. The segment on Dynamite was very unique in that page was kind of saying that punk is not the mentor and the leader and kind of treated punk as if he was an interloper into the company i was curious if you could give us some insight into your reaction to that and how free-flowing were the comments allowed versus bullet points and things like that because it kind of took things in a much different direction than we had seen with punk and page in recent weeks well i think they want to get in the ring and fight and they're not friends. They don't like each other. And I think it makes perfect sense. Hangman would feel that way given that CM Punk has come in and not only has he fought to get in this position to be the challenger to Hangman's world championship, he's fought some of Hangman's friends along the way. When CM Punk was wrestling John Silver a few weeks ago on Dynamite, Hangman didn't look amused at all by any of it. He especially didn't like it when CM Punk used that buckshot lariat. 
And I don't think he took kindly to that, but he also clearly hasn't taken kindly to CM Punk has been a focus of this promotion and he's earned it. He's had great matches. He's demanded, uh, commanded attention from the fans by, uh, you know, returning after this crazy layoff, shocking people all over the world, setting merchandise records for us, pay-per-view records for us. You know, he earned this position. And I think if you're somebody who's been here, got in on the ground floor and helped establish AEW from the ground up, I can imagine uh, you wouldn't take kindly to that. You would take exception to that. But that's what makes it a compelling title fight. And I think these two are not going to be friends. They're not going to go out to lunch. They're not going to want to spend any time together outside of the wrestling ring where it's the health of each other. And uh, I I don't think he minced any words about how he felt. And I don't think CM Punk's a big fan of his either. So I, uh, I'm i really looking forward to seeing those guys fight, especially after how things ended. It seems like it's going to be a very tense situation the next couple of days. And I believe it is a main event fans all over the world are looking forward to. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I'm going to go with a question now from TK, TK Trinidad from uh, Women's Wrestling Talk. And after Tony answers, next up after that would be Chris Bueller from Bleacher Report. Here's um, uh, TK's question, Tony. It's great that we have three women's matches on the card for Double or Nothing. Is it possible with a future pay-per-view to have possibly one of the women's matches be the main event? Well, we've had some great main events. So far in AEW with great women's matches, we're, we've had uh, Battle of the Belts. Both Battle of the Belts have been headlined by the Women's World Championship. We had Thunder Rosa versus Nyla Rose at Battle of the Belts 2. And big success with Dr. Britt Baker versus Riho for the title at the original Battle of the Belts did a great number. And we had uh, the original Grand Slam, AEW Grand Slam Dynamite at Arthur Ashe Stadium, main evented, the biggest TV show in our history, main evented by Dr. Britt Baker versus Ruby Soho. And we had uh, the AEW St. Patrick's Day Slam has twice been main evented by Dr. Britt Baker versus Thunder Rosa in two classic matches. Uh, Thunder Rosa winning the Lights Out match unsanctioned and then coming back a year later in her home state, winning the title in Texas at St. Patrick's Day Slam 2, in a steel cage match. So we've had lots of great women's main events across on Dynamite and Rampage. And of course, where Rampage, the first ever main event, the first episode was Red Velvet versus Dr. Britt Baker in her hometown, Pittsburgh for the title. So we had a lot of great women's main events on Dynamite, Rampage and the Battle of the Belts. And I think uh, for all those shows, they were great. And certainly for our pay-per-views, uh, if we get the match where it's the main event, it, it's unquestionably the biggest match on the show. Like I feel Hangman Page versus CM Punk right now is the main event. Then I believe that that would be great. And I would, I would love to put that match in the main event spot, just like we have for many of the biggest shows in the history of this company, including Grand Slam, our biggest TV show. And like I said, the first Rampage and many others. Appreciate the question from TK Trinidad. Um, as promised, Chris Mueller from Bleach Report is next. And after Chris, we'll go with Sean Ross Sapp from Fightful. Chris? Hey, Tony. Thanks for taking the time. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about a pattern we've seen develop with we see wrestlers being allowed to express themselves for issues they care about, like Black Lives Matter, the LGBTQ community, and recently CM Punk with the pro choice shirts. I was just hoping you could talk about why it's important to allow your pro wrestlers to be able to express their concerns for things like equality and safe access to women's health care. I want the wrestlers uh, to be able to speak their minds and feel like this is a place where they have freedom to talk about things they care about. And, and I think the connection the wrestlers have with the fans, people know that this is their authentic thoughts. They're sharing them on social media and, you know, the wrestlers you see on TV. One of the great things about AEW is I think people see through the great engagement that wrestlers have with their fans on social media, that this is who these people are. And there's real 
there's just a lot of authenticity on AEW television about who these people are. And I think uh, for them and for, for JR, when he talked last night, I think it means a lot to them. And, and hopefully they'll not only connect with their fans, but work harder and harder and harder to make AEW a, a better place in and out of the ring for the wrestlers. Fantastic. Thanks, Chris. Sean Ross Sapp is next from Fightful. And after that, I'm going to follow with the write in from Kevin Mitchie from Sportsnet. Sean? Sean, if you're trying to talk, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Uh, the, the Owen Hart tournament's going on right now, uh, and it's wrapping up this Sunday. Do you have any insight on sort of what the, the winners will get? Will it be a trophy, uh, like a custom championship belt? How will, how will that work? Well, I think on Sunday at Double or Nothing, people are going to see what the winners of the Owen Hart tournament will receive, and it's one of the exciting things about the event. And I think people are looking forward to the unveiling of what the winners will receive. And, I, and it, it'll be something really nice. It's something that we've shown to Dr. Martha Hart and her family and gotten their approval. It's really, really cool. And I think the Owen Hart tournament and the great wrestling around it and, and the matches that have led up to the finals, and then now the finals themselves on Double or Nothing gives you a lot of reasons to want to watch Double or Nothing on pay-per-view, but also uh, for those of you who are interested in what exactly the winners are going to receive, you'll find out at Double or Nothing, and I promise it'll be cool. Thanks, Sean. Here's the question, Tony, from Kevin Mishy. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, from Sportsnet. When will AEW expand to international touring more specifically, Canada. And any Canadian cities identified as a potential first visit for a for, 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 for location, Tony? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would love to bring AEW to Canada. We're expanding right now. We've, we've been back on tour for less than a year. We were shut down for you know about a year and a half through the pandemic where their live event touring was shut down. And now we're back and we're servicing markets in the United States that we'd originally planned to go to back in 2020. And so Canada has been on our list for a long time and it's something we're def excuse me, definitely going to do um, in the near future. And uh, I don't have the exact date yet, but I'm really looking forward to bringing AEW to Canada. We have great media partners in Canada with TSN carrying Dynamite and Rampage now. And, and uh, I believe not only the support of uh, TSN, but also a lot of the local media up there. There are huge wrestling fans in Canada, in part because there have been so many great Canadian pro wrestlers. And a lot of those great Canadian pro wrestlers are in AEW right now. And uh, we just saw one of them, Kyle O'Reilly, coming very close to making the Owen Hart Finals. Did it great match in the semifinals of course Chris Jericho one of the great legends of the sport and Kenny Omega one of the great champions in AEW and all over the world and uh, I can't wait to bring AEW to Canada personally I'm, I love the country I, I, I have visited uh, before I had uh, a stake in the wrestling business myself but I, I actually drove up there uh, to go to WrestleMania 18 as a fan in 2002 on my spring break in college. And I love going up to Canada recreationally. It's fun. It's beautiful. And my family, in addition to the auto parts business, uh, has a lot of uh, business ventures there, including my father is the owner of the Four Seasons Hotel in Toronto. And there are a lot of great cities all, all across Canada, but I think if we were to debut somewhere, I think it would be great to debut in Toronto where my family has something so special going with the Four Seasons Hotel. And my dad has tons of factories and, and connections in Ontario. So 
uh, that would be pretty cool. All right, thank you very much, Tony. We've got a couple more here to go. We're getting close Great. to the top of the hour. Um, we're, Stephanie Francone from Seal Chair, I'm gonna go with you next. And we're gonna follow Stephanie with Nick Hausman from Wrestling Inc. And then after Nick, we'll do one more. So uh, Stephanie, you're up. Hi, Tony. Hi. It's been a while. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, and I'm very happy to talk to you again. Um, we had a, a very good surprise last, last week, sorry. Um, uh, to see Johnny Mundo Elito, he had so many names to be the Joker on the um, O&R tournament. Yes. I'm thinking about signing him full time and making him Johnny Elite. Thank well, you. Well, John, thank you, thank you for asking. Uh, John is tremendous. I really like Johnny Elite, and it was great to have him debut in the Owen Hart tournament as a Joker. And he was a very important person in the tournament. He came in and provided a big surprise. And he also gave a great match to Samoa Joe. And now with Samoa Joe going into the finals, earning his place last night, that match uh, looks even more important in hindsight. And I think he had a great debut. And I definitely brought him in with the thought that this is somebody uh, I would be open to bring him back and interested to bring back in the future and after the great debut match he had I'm still very interested and probably even more interested now in John coming back so yes absolutely I'd, I'd be very open to that I think Johnny's great and uh, we'd love to see Johnny Elite again in AEW thanks for asking thanks Steph um, okay as promised Nick Hausman from Wrestling Inc uh, is next, and we will finish today with AJ Awesome uh, at, at, at the top of the hour. So, uh, Nick, you're up. All right. Hey, Tony, thanks so much for the time. Hey, thank you, Nick. I appreciate it. Yeah, I love that you're keeping everything in my backyard of Chicago. It's wonderful. It makes things easy for me. <laughs> um, so, uh, I want to ask you about Ring of Honor. When can fans expect, you know, some news about what exactly is going on here, TV, live events-wise? Can you give us a little timeline on when we're going to see the ball really start running or rolling here with uh, Ring of Honor? We're still working on that, and it's an exciting time in media. Again, like I mentioned, it's, it's big for AEW that we've uh, gotten some very kind interest and in that we're, we're being uh, – hosted in Los Angeles by the biggest content creators in the world, Warner Brothers Discovery, our great media partner. And that is a great conversation that I have had with them and I'm going to continue having with them about what could potentially be the future for Ring of Honor in conjunction with the future of things we can do to expand the AEW audience and expand the ways we deliver AEW content to our fans. In addition to all the awesome uh, shows we have now with Dynamite on TBS and with Rampage and Battle of the Belts on TNT. So going into uh, where it all began three years ago at Double or Nothing, starting our the fourth year of the company, it is amazing to me how AEW has grown and uh, continues to expand around the world. And Ring of Honor has been around for 20 years. And we celebrated the 20th anniversary of Ring of Honor this, this year, really recently, last uh in the last uh, couple months, actually. And I would love to get Ring of Honor weekly TV series or streaming series, wherever it ends up going very soon. And it's something that I am working on and I think would be awesome for the fans. In addition to the great shows they get from AEW, there's a lot of Ring of Honor fans around the world that, that can't wait till the TV comes back. And I, I am hopeful we'll have Ring of Honor TV and also continue the great calendar of Ring of Honor pay-per-view events. Supercard of Honor, as I mentioned earlier today, was a big success for us. And I'd like to bring Ring of Honor back to pay-per-view as well and follow up on it. And we have great wrestlers in Ring of Honor and great champions right now. So I think the company is in the strongest position it's been in a long time or frankly ever uh, with our love and support and the fact that I really care about Ring of Honor and, and so everything we're doing to 
grow uh, and nurture that business going forward, but but also my financial resources behind it. Uh, and, and combining that with what I believe is some acumen for this business, I think Ring of Honor will be in its best position possible. And I don't know when the TV will start back up on a weekly basis, but that is my goal to get it going again and, and something I'm working on. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Tony. Uh, and here we are with our final uh, uh, member of the media will be AJ Awesome from the AJ Awesome Show. AJ. You saved the best for last, Jim. Hi, AJ. I was on purpose. <laughs> AJ. Um, you people have been talking about trios tag team titles, but have you been thinking about having any other tag team titles like women's tag team belts or women's trios tag team titles also? Yeah, I have. Um, we have a lot of great wrestlers in AEW and a lot of great women's and men wrestlers in AEW. Uh, so I have thought about doing those. And I think as we continue expanding the roster and hopefully get more teams and also get some people who've been injured on the shelf back, I think uh, that would be something I, I would love to do in the future. Uh, and the trios belts, again, would, would that you mentioned, uh, would be – something uh, that I think the fans would really enjoy and a lot of the fans have called for, but, but, you know, I, I also uh, really uh, would, would love to uh, add more titles and more champions as we go, if they make sense. And uh, those are both cool ones. Also, I think both cool ideas and, and stuff we talked about also. 